thank you everyone for joining today, uh, joining our Taboola webinar. Please feel free to engage in the comment section, add your name and where you guys are dialing in from. I mentioned I'm dialing in from London. James and Joe, do you want to mention yours? Yeah, I am currently in Kansas City, although I normally live in uh, West Hollywood, California. And I'm in uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, out of my home office today. So um, yeah, nothing too exciting on my side. <laughs> While we're waiting for a few more people to join, um, I'll just set the scene. So this session will be focused on how to scale your native ads with Taboola. We are back with another live Q&A session. We did this session earlier this year and it was a huge success. We had hundreds of people submitting questions. So I'm really excited to be running this again. And of course, this time I am joined by our two amazing industry experts who have a wealth of knowledge on these topics. Yeah, definitely excited to be uh, a part of it. You know, scaling is a question that everybody always wants to uh, ask about. So hopefully we can give a little bit clarity and detail on how to do it. Absolutely. I'll give us a bit of an introduction now. So my name is Susie. I've been with Taboola Brat for about four and a half years now, and I've worked on many different types of successful native ad campaigns across a variety of industries. I'm also very passionate about diversity and inclusion within our industry, and I lead our ERG group, Taboola in Culture, within Taboola. Um, Joe and James, I'll let you introduce yourselves. Uh, yeah, thanks. So my uh, name is Joe Burton. I'm the CEO of ROI Marketplace. We are one of the few, I think, native-only ad agencies out there. Um, I've been doing this. ROI is nine years old. I've been in the business since... 2005 right out of college um, and we built a you know, really solid business with a lot of great clients and we're always looking to give back to the community and do things like this to help others out. Great. I uh, am James Van Ellswick. No, it's popping a little bit. Oh. James, have we still got you there? Must be that KC barbecue. <laughs> oh, you're back now, James. You cut off there. Do you want to start that again? Yeah, sorry. Okay, so I'm James Van Ellswick. I have been media buying for 10 years. Uh, started out in Facebook 2012, 2013. I spent over 100 mil on ads uh, across all sorts of, uh, you know, traffic sources, offers. Sometimes I run as an affiliate. Um, I've also got a native ad agency called Symphony Agency, where we buy on behalf of clients on native channels. And I have a copywriting agency called zero to one dot inc, where we focus on writing advertorials, um, which obviously are very important for natives. We do this for lead gen and e-com companies. So I'm, I'm fully uh, invested in the media buying, traffic buying world. Definitely loads of um, knowledge between the two of you guys. Um, before we get into the session, for those of you who are new to native advertising, native ads are a type of online advertising that match the platform or website where they appear. So rather than stand out, they're actually designed to blend in with the user experience, allowing to add to the ad to look and feel organic to the content on the page and gives the user a lot more of a less destructive experience. So now we'll jump straight into the Q&A section. We got loads of questions submitted by you guys. So we tried to choose the ones that had the most crossover, but please feel free to add some more to the comment section. And if we have time at the end, we'll answer a few more. All right, so the first question is how to utilize smart bids. I made a few slides on this, so it can be a little bit more clear. So to unpack the question, Firstly, Smart Bid is our automated bidding strategy, and it does all the heavy lifting for you. So once you set your baseline bid, Smart Bid will use network data and any data that you send us through the pixel to adjust your bids in search of increased conversion rates. And you also have the option to adjust your bids yourselves on the Buy Site tab and on Taboola Ads. So you still have some level of control there. But within the smart bid um, features, we do have a layer of protection, which is lowest cost bidding. And that feature reduces the cost of the winning bid in the auction to the second price bid. So it ensures that you're only paying the absolute lowest for each click. So <clears throat> why should you use smart bid? So firstly, I would say it identifies opportunities that you would miss with fixed bid because of the different data signals it has access to. 
It helps you reach efficiency and scale much faster and maximize your conversions. It actually increases the conversion rate by about 24% by bidding at the right moments. And it's always learning. So the longer you use Smart Bid, the smarter it will get. James, Joe, do you have anything to add to the Smart Bid section? Yeah, I mean, we use Smart Bid on you know, most of our campaigns for sure. Um, there's so many publishers inside of Taboola's network that if you're bidding one fixed bid for all of them, you know, it's just, you know, it doesn't work great. Everything's got a different value points. So um, we've seen it evolve over the past couple of years and it'll really be a, you know, a great algorithm, you know, and it's really helped our campaigns quite a bit. Nice, Joe. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and how to utilize it. So I would say definitely start with a smart bid campaign. And the Smart Bid campaign is really important to start with so you can gather the learnings from the very beginning. Next is to set up the pixel right away. So the CPCs will be adjusted, not just using the network data that Taboola already have, but also the data that you send us through your unique pixel. And lastly, A-B test. Um, Smart Bid is not a be or end or tool. So definitely still test different targeting options, creatives, platforms to help you reach your target goal faster. So the next question is, what are some common pitfalls to avoid when scaling native ads with Taboola? Joe, I know you had a lot to say on this earlier, so I'll let you take this one. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of them, right? And the reason that agencies like James and I exist is, you know, it's different, right? I think the biggest mistake that people make is copy and paste in their Facebook campaign into a Taboola spreadsheet and expecting it to work. It's just a very different mindset and model, right? Um, copy is super, super important. You know, James had mentioned his editorial company. Uh, we do editorials here as well. And, you know, copywriting is just so, so important with it. And then it's being hands on with your campaigns. You know, you can't, even with SmartFid, even with, you know, the algorithms, you can't just turn a campaign on and, you know, expect the algorithm to do all the work for you. It's a very hands on process. And I think it's super important to be in there every single day, you know, looking at widgets, looking at the engagement rates and, you know, making adjustments based on what you're seeing happening. Yeah, absolutely. I think another point I would say is so a common pitfall is too much targeting at the very start. Um, mm -hmm. We do have all of those targeting options available, but Taboola is a discovery platform. So you need to allow the algorithm to take time to understand your target audience and discover those new users for you. Yeah, we'll structure a campaign like, you know, desktop, all browsers, and then we'll get some audience data, and then we'll dupe that campaign with the best targeting options, whether that's, you know, different browsers, different audience inside of Taboola. The fact that you guys have a really intelligent audience base is huge. I mean, three, four years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, you know, so when you do that, you're right, start out big and then narrow it down smaller. I think also too, like um, when it comes to scaling, you have to understand that when you scale, when you increase bids, when you increase budgets, and this is on any platform, you're mm -hmm. gonna lose ROI. So you need mm -hmm. to make sure that you optimize well enough to create a margin to to scale because you're going to lose some of that ROI. So you, if you're already tight on your profit margin, you need to optimize more to make scaling possible. And I think the more you scale too, you know, the better your ROI does get based on brand recognition. Like if you're up there top load on some major sites every single day, yeah, you might take that hit up front, but over time, I actually think it starts to come back down. Um, because again, point. you're cementing yourself as like the lead advertiser in that category and I mean, publisher site. That's a good point. Yeah, one thing that we didn't mention as well is like starting with a low budget. It's really important to scale. Like scaling requires a sufficient budget, similar to any other platform. The algorithm definitely needs that budget at the beginning stages. And if you give up too soon, you will never reap the benefits of spending in the beginning and get to the scaling phase. I agree. Cool. And this goes into the next question as well. So how to test Taboola. Um, the first thing, as we mentioned, is definitely coming in with a good budget. Um, it's the most important thing, I would say, or the most important element when testing Taboola. We recommend at least £100 per day or five times your CPA goal. So if your CPA or CPL goal cost per lead is around £25, you should have a daily budget of at least 125 to see, to let the algorithm scale and at least reach five conversions per day. 
Um, next to that would be the creatives. We want at least six variations of headlines and images to start with. You can mix and match three headlines, three images, and use those to start with. And that goes hand in hand with patience. You need at least seven to 10 days to produce results in the beginning stages. And thereafter, once you've left that crucial learning phase, you can start optimizing by publisher and creative and then lead to that scaling phase. Yeah, this is a good uh, outline of things. Um, I think like the more that you spend, the faster you're going to learn because the whole process in the beginning is acquiring data. Like that's just the game is like learning about the different elements of your funnel. Um, and then the seven to 10 days for results is also interesting because it's important to split your testing over a minimum of seven days because ads, offers, everything is going to perform differently on weekdays. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's, he's frozen. So, James, you froze there a little bit. You said everything is going to be different. Users yeah. active on weekdays and then you lost. Yeah, space. everything's going to be different. You know, like lead generation, for example, it's usually really hot on Mondays and mm -hmm. we'll kind of die off Friday afternoon. And then e -com can be great on the weekends. So if you try to test too quickly, you might miss out on really profitable days if you start your testing on the wrong days. So it's important to try to always run tests over a seven day period. Totally agree. We see the same thing. Um, you know, some of our offers do 80% of their revenue on Saturday and Sunday. Others are strong Monday to Friday and it's riding those trends out and it's not getting too knee jerky, right? Like you have mm -hmm. a bad day. Um, you shouldn't kill everything. You have a good day. You shouldn't scale everything. Like you gotta be, you know, a little bit intelligent about it because, you know, things are going to average out over a seven or 10 day period. Definitely completely agree with those points there. The next question is, what are the best practices for affiliate marketing? James, let me grab that. Yeah, let me grab that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, there's a lot here and I'll kind of just uh, unpack some of the important like major principles, right? So being an affiliate, when you are advertising other products and you're getting offers from networks, you are going to see other people running similar ads, similar funnels, et cetera. To make big money on an affiliate order offer, you have to crack something fairly unique, right? If you're just ripping and copying, it's really hard to make a margin because they've already gotten there first. There's a first mover advantage. It's good to use what your competitors are doing or certain things close to that to get a baseline. But if you really want to crack something wide open, you're going to need to create something unique. Like it's just the only way to find like big, big profit. The second thing is like when it comes to affiliate marketing to not be tricked by the payout, right? The payout does not matter. The earnings per click is what matters, right? So the payout times the conversion rate is what matters. Um, a lot of times people say like, oh, look, that's got a hundred dollar payout. And they start doing the math and say, okay, 20% margin, I'm gonna make 20 bucks. But remember the higher the payout, very often the more the cost to test it is gonna be like using the example that we saw earlier, if you're trying to multiply five times the CPA and your CPA is expensive, that's gonna be difficult. Um, the second thing I think when being an affiliate is understanding that you should always be split testing offers in the back end. Uh, different networks are gonna convert differently. Some networks are gonna scrub, some networks aren't gonna scrub, some pages are gonna work better. So I think when it comes to an offer that you wanna run, it may not be that the offer is no good. It may be the offer hosted by a certain network is no good. I think that's important. And then finally, I think spying and, and seeing what's working on the network is a good way to go and being smart with seasonal, um, you know, e-commerce gadgets at certain times a year are amazing. Air cooler certain times a year is amazing. Um, and if you think that you see things that are running hot that you don't feel are, well, I guess there's always a question of is something saturated or should I run it because everyone else is having success? I like to be somewhere in the middle. I like to catch a trend early where I see people having success and I see like one or two competitors scaling. I like to get in and ride that wave as opposed to, you know, I'm doing listicles on December 20th, right? It's done already. Like you just need to be smart, find something that's working for other people, but also find it a bit earlier in the trend. Those would be my few best practices for affiliate marketing. 
I completely agree. Getting in there early is super important. And we do see a lot of trends continue um, to do the same thing every year. So if you see like air coolers working every summertime, it's a great way to build up to that in the next coming year, because that's something we've seen on the Tabula network again and again that has seen loads of success. Yeah. And also, it, look, it comes back to the, the affiliate network that you get the offers from, right? Like air coolers, you could split test probably 10 different air cooler offers. I'm a DFO guy when it comes to my e-com gadget stuff very often, especially for air coolers. You know, find a network that has a well-optimized offer that pays, that's got it internationally. I think also international is a huge thing. When you can learn to run traffic outside the United States, the game gets so much easier. If you can find something in Europe or in Spanish language, these are like edges where you can run a lot of the same offers, but in a much less competitive environment and much cheaper cost per click. For sure. UK, US and Canada do have a lot more higher CPCs than these other markets. So that's a great tip to give, James. Thank you. <laughs> next question is how to scale e-commerce campaigns and maintain CPA. You touched on a lot of that here, James, but Joe, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, e-com is one of my favorite things to scale. And, you know, James, a lot of what you said about affiliate marketing holds true. Um, first and foremost, uh, the most important thing for a good e-com offer is a good story behind it, right? You know, how are you selling to the need of a consumer and what need does that, you know, product solve for somebody? You know, James mentioned air coolers. Well, if it's 85 or 95 degrees in your office and you see an air cooler off, you may click and convert on it, right? Because it solves a need that you have right now. Um, but you may not probably wouldn't sell that same air cooler in November or December when it's, you know, 35 degrees outside. So um, the content is absolutely critical. A good editorial and an optimized funnel is how those campaigns are going to work. Um, understanding seasonality behind things, you know, certain trends year over year kind of hold true. Um, understanding that things sell in the summer, they don't sell in the winter and vice versa. Um, and obviously getting ahead of those trends. And, you know, this comes back to the point James made about, you know, noticing but not copying. I think the worst thing you can do is rip somebody's editorial and headlines. It does not work, period. Like, you may get a short blip of it, but all you guys are doing is trading sales and jacking each other's costs up. So focusing on new angles and unique angles or how to really make these things take off. Um, and again, uh, focusing a little bit more on copy and image you know, creation is just a great way to scale a campaign. Yeah, we do see a lot of advertisers copy other advertisers. And it is a shame because if That's you're right. not first in the market, it's going to be really hard to scale off that. And it's, of course, very dis like in unencouraging for the advertisers that are getting ripped off, seeing their landing pages everywhere. It's really not nice, I can imagine. <laughs> Yeah, so if James and I are running the same offer and James has a top spot in MSN, right, and I copy all of his images and headlines and all that, I could probably got to pay 30% more out of the gates to overtake him, which means I'm eating up my revenue and I'm losing money. He's mm -hmm. been there longer. He's more positioned. He's got to work that. Over time, his bids start to climb up because he's now competing against me and we're both losing, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm much better off writing a brand new headline or image combination and try to beat his out and getting a, you know, a big boost that way. So. Um, we see it all the time. It's part of the business, but you know, it's something I really, I can't stand personally. Absolutely. Yeah. Taking that inspiration is, is really important. Like you said, advertorials with testimonials um, and how the products have made other users feel is a great way to tell your story and make it unique to your brand without ripping off somebody else's. My copywriters are flipping out editorial variations, a new copy every single week, and we're always split testing. You know, you don't always win. Some of your, you know, times your controls can hold for a long time. But we're always testing new angles. Yes. Let's get into the next question. So, what metrics should I track when scaling native ads on Taboola? This, I would say, varies, of course, depending on your main KPI. But overall, the scaling factor we see on Taboola is the CPM. And that's made up of the CPC and the CTR. So you first need to come into the auction with a competitive CPC. If you have an account manager, you can lean on them to help guide you on where to start with your CPCs. Um, and secondly, it would be the CTR, which is very important to keep your eye on, as this will indicate how engaging your ads are. Um, so those are the three metrics that I would recommend. Anything else that you guys would like to add? I mean, look, obviously my biggest thing is profitability, right? I've had campaigns where I've made a lot of money with a low CTR and a high bid because the payout afforded it or the offer converted well. But I think that the CTR for me is the key to getting something to scale. You know, um, 
higher the CTR, the less I can pay for the amount of traffic, right? It's just a math equation, as you said. So if I can get a nice ECPM, I'm going to get a bunch of scale. Um, and I think that the, you know, the bid is obviously the easy way to scale. Mm -hmm. uh, getting higher CTRs is a little bit harder to scale, but a lot more profitable. Yeah, it's a balancing act, right? I mean, the age old thing is your, you know, your image is your CTR and your headlines, your conversion rate. And how do you balance those two where you're, you know, getting a high enough click level, but not misleading your consumers with just a crazy image that gets lots of clicks, right? Um, we look at a lot of engagement rate conversions as well, aka how many people are making it from the editorial to the next page in our funnel. Um, that helps, especially on the higher priced items like James Bench's $100 plus CPA payouts. Well, if I can put an editorial in there and I see a certain publisher has a 2% versus a 22% CTR from editorial to offer page, I can get a, get a pretty good feeling for whether that publisher is a good fit for them. Um, and some of that stuff really helps us to save some money up front. Yeah, the working on the CTR is definitely the most cost, best cost way to reduce your overall um, CPA goal. Um, one thing that I would also mention is we have so many tools on Taboola that can help with your CTR. So adding descriptions, CTA buttons to your headlines and images, giving the user a bit more information before they have that first click will also reduce your bounce rate. So having a really good description that lets the user know what they're clicking on and a CTA so they know what you're they're expected to do as an action point once they reach that page is a great way to increase your CTR as well. And I love your new GIF stuff, by the way, the GIF and the small video images that are all stock. Those are huge. I got some stock images that are now my controls that I just got through Taboo. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. So to add on that, we have Getty images available on Taboola. So you can use stock images directly from the Taboola ads platform. And to add to that, we also released a new feature, I think, earlier this year, which is the create to be able a tool to be able to create motion ads on the platform. Mm -hmm. So it's a motion ad studio and you can add any static image that you already have or pull it from the Getty images and add some movement to it. So that's what Joe is just mentioning about. We use it daily. It's really helped, honestly. Um, GIFs are harder to come by than stock images. And the fact that you guys actually have good ones, not just, you know, junk images are huge. Yes, please do check that out. Also, the next question is how to scale lead gen campaigns on Taboola? Let me grab that one. Um, I think scaling a lead gen campaign and scaling an e-com campaign to me is very similar. It's still conversion based. It's still cost per conversion. There's a ROAS aspect to e-com sometimes, but when it comes to scaling either one of them, I think you need to understand what is acceptable to scale and then how does scaling actually happen, right? You, I don't want to scale anything with too small of a margin. So when I look at the process of being able to scale, it's built off the optimization phase. Once I've optimized the front end to get up to that 30, 35, 40% ROI, now I have the ability to scale, right? So let's look what happens. Let's say that I have a stable CTR image that I'm using. My landing page pre-sale uh, click-through rate is stable. My offer conversion rate is stable, right? There's the way to get more traffic, which is what scaling is, is to increase the bid, right? That's the simplest, fastest way. I'm going to pay more per visitor. If I have a 30% ROI, and in order to get a bunch more traffic, I've got to bump my bids 20%, I've effectively just left 10% of my margin, right? So it's important that even if you're profitable, it doesn't mean that you're scalable, so I think starting to understand what it's going to take and how much you need to optimize before you scale is very important uh, as a step one. And then, as we said, the CTR is everything, right? Like that to me is the easiest way to uh, scale. If you've already optimized your pre-sale, your offer conversion rate is stable, we like to run just like a dummy campaign or an image testing campaign that's just running at a low budget every day that's just testing images. Because if I have a campaign that, let's say I scaled it, I was at 30% ROI, scaled it, and now I'm at a 15% ROI. If I can get like a fire image and pop that in there, now I'm going to be able to either reduce my bid or spend the same and just get more traffic and have a higher profit margin. So I think like the real key to uh, scaling, at least for me, is the, uh, is the CTRs. I think also like paying attention to publishers that have scale or do not have scale 
you have to realize sometimes some pubs are not going to scale. Like just because you're paying more for traffic, they may not have more to give where you have other big ones where, you know, you can spend as much money as you want. So being smart about where you spend your money and pay attention when you make those bid changes, what is actually getting you traffic and what isn't getting you traffic is really, uh, you know, a, a crucial thing. And then also, you know, we didn't get into much devices, but like we can get into this as well, right? It's like, eventually, when you pay attention to your device types, some will just have better margins than others. So you have to make a decision. Do you want to run them together and then eventually split them up and say, I can pay more for iOS traffic than yep. I can for Android traffic? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to, to play, but all of this is built on optimizing your funnel, right? Add, headline, landing page, an offer. Once those things are in place, then you can start to play around with all the other stuff. But if you try to scale half-baked and you're not optimized, it's going to keep crashing. You can't get too happy just because you're profitable. Sorry. Yeah, I love a... that. No, I love that. I think you're absolutely right, James. I think, um, I think lead gen is a little easier to scale only because with lead gen, I think you don't lose sales to other sources, right? So with e-com and things like that, a lot of times you're introducing that product to somebody. So maybe they click on you, they read your avatar, they go to your page, they see your price, and then they Google you looking for a coupon or a discount code on it, right? They go to Amazon and type it and try to find it cheaper. Um, it's all part of the funnel. It's all great for the brand owner. But with lead gen, I don't think you still have that same drop-off. You basically, if you're in a sales or a lead funnel, you either fill it out or you don't. Um, you don't really research it all that heavy. So. And you're absolutely right. I mean, breaking those things out by devices and operating systems and audience targeting. And there's a million things that you could be testing every single day and watching it like a hawk and just adjusting daily. Absolutely. And you would make really great points there. And that feeds well into our next question on how to scale and maintain quality. Um, you all really mentioned how to scale in general, but is there a specific way in how you maintain the quality? Sure. You want me to grab that one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that um, step one is when you're looking at quality, you need to define what quality is, right? Like, are you saying quality that works for the back end? Is it the quality of traffic? I think a big mistake that a lot of people make is they don't pass the variables to the ads back to the network or the offer or Shopify, or whatever the case may be. Because sometimes if you take a look at the full funnel, like what needs to happen after someone fills out the form or someone after they purchase something, you're looking for more of a lifetime value or a value of the next step, which we can't see in the platform. If mm -hmm. we pass our variables forward, publishers, ad images, headlines, then we can match that up on the back end and say like, hey, for example, e-commerce product this uh publisher maybe it's a little more expensive but it has a higher aov right mm -hmm. or on a lead gen campaign hey it's a little bit more expensive but it's better than a lead they actually turn into deals so i yep. think it's important to pa pass the variables into the back end so that you can kind of analyze what's going on second thing i would say is you know we talk about high ctr images and and i'll just say creatives right high high ctr creatives the combination of the image and the headline you know, when you want to get a high CTR, the more, let's say, clickbaity or curiosity based your headlines are, you will get the highest click through rate. Like that's what works. Like curiosity is what gets people to click. When you see you won't believe what happened next, you know, human nature wants to know what happens next. And then they click on the ad. If it's super clickbaity and you're just getting people there, but they're not somewhat bought in, the, the traffic quality will be bad because you're just inviting curiosity traffic. I like to do something that's like a flagged clickbait, I call it. So it's like it can still be clickbaity, but it has to mention what the next step is in the clickbait. You know, so it, it's usually I'm saying what the product is in the major part of the headline, and then I'm adding clickbait in parentheses. So like subconsciously, they see, oh, this is for car loans, but the clickbait is what gets them to click to get to the car loan. So by like matching the clickbait and what's actually happening is going to help increase the uh, the quality. And then finally, like the pre-sales, like the job of a pre-sale is to clean up the traffic and get people excited to buy something like the click-through rate on Taboola 
is it's not a super high click through rate because these people are like engaged reading their publication. They're on CNN or Condé Nast or MSN. They're enjoying their day. They didn't go on there and say they want to go shopping or they want to fill out a lead gen form. This ad is interrupting that experience. And that's the beauty of natives. And then they get to the pre-sell page. It, it has to sell them there. Like the pre-sell needs to do the heavy lifting so that after they read that and they're excited and they've been marketing to, they're going to go to the next step. You know, and the pre-sell has to kind of serve as that filter and exciter to make sure that the traffic you have coming in gets cleaned up, right? And and even if it's a good publisher, if it's not the, if they're not ready to buy, you wouldn't call that quality traffic, right? You need to clean up the traffic and get them ready to do what you want them to do with the pre-sell page. So yeah. that would that would be the three biggest things that I would I would utilize when it comes to traffic quality. To mention the pre-sell page, that goes nicely into our next question. So what are the best practices for these pre-sell pages and landing pages? Um, very top level, I would say focus on the content structure, like you mentioned, James. What is the problem you're trying to solve? How does your product or service help? And why should the user take action now? Make sure to like create that sense of urgency without being clickbaity, as you mentioned, James, but tell the user precisely what you want them to do, whether that be buy now, sign up. The call to action is what I would say is really important to have on that landing page. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, I think a page should be structured like this, right? The first third should be really catchy and selling the product. You kind of have your meat in the middle, which is your specifics about the product, et cetera. And then it's got to close strong with a clear call to action. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how important split testing is there. You know, you want to educate but not mislead your consumer. If you take into some page that promises to cure diseases and solve other financial problems and do things, you're not going to build any trust with that user. You know, they're going to click off of there knowing they're reading garbage. Um, users are very intelligent out there. So you have to solve the need without misleading somebody. Definitely. Like you said, A-B test, because users will act differently on a desktop to a tablet to a mobile. So one landing page that you see is converting really well on mobile might not be the same on desktop. So colors. I mean, it can be color schemes, images, lead-ins, mm -hmm. lead-outs, buttons, widgets. I mean, there's a million things you can test there and they all have an impact. Um, and again, we're testing every single day. We're throwing new pages out there. I think... Um with the landing page, because for me, landing pages are life. Like that's what makes the whole thing work. It's understanding what to optimize that's gonna make a difference and what is just kind of a waste of time because you wanna split test a lot of pages. So it's like, as your landing pages get better, you can start to test smaller and smaller things. But like in the beginning, that top headline and top image is what's gonna make the biggest effect. Like that's the game, right? Optimizing that step one, and then working down the page, step two, I think is really crucial. And also using a tool like a mouse flow or a hot jar, it shows you really clearly when people leave and where they leave. Like you, you understand where you start to have a problem with the page. And it really hit me when I look at like the heat maps. If only 30% of my people are getting to my call to action button on the bottom, like it's a problem, right? Yep. You need to start to look at it and say, well, if I send a hundred visitors, how many are even getting the opportunity to click the buy now button? You know, um, and I think that that's important. I think some people try to slide the button up too high. They don't really sell the client before they get to the button. There's so much theory, but I think like um, just split testing the top, the top image, top headline, and then utilizing a heat mapping tool, you can really optimize landing pages pretty well. You can like, you could really see what's going on. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the CTA at the bottom. That's really important at Taboola as well, because you'd notice most all of our ads are at the bottom of pages because that's that moment of next and when the user is ready to discover something new. Yeah. All right. So the next question, talking about all of this success with different pages, can you provide an example of a successful campaign that you guys personally have scaled with Taboola? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of them over the years, for sure. Um, we've had some failures as well, of course, but a lot of successful campaigns. Um, some of our best ones have been staying very topical um, with the U.S. economy right now and people kind of worried about stock exchanges and long-term retirement plans and whatnot. We've had a really successful campaign for alternative investments, which is money outside of an IRA or 401k or a retirement fund. Um, it's engaging at a high rate. It's now the engagement's also converting on their sales floor at a very high rate. They're able to 
you know, not only get someone on the phone, but talk to them, actually sell their product to them. Um, that a lot of successful e-com campaigns, you know, again, e-com is kind of more of a Q4 thing. Holiday shopping is huge then. Um, that can be successful, you know, earlier in the year as well. And we're currently running a super successful campaign that's in like the uh, luxury and recreation department. You know, I can't share competitor names and all that stuff, but it's basically what do people want to do in the summer? They want to travel, they want to play golf, they want to, you know, have fun. And we have a campaign doing very, very well in one of those niches. Right. Yeah. So not to give too much private data about your clients, you can also log into our, our case study page, the Taboola case study page on taboola.com forward slash resources. And there you'll be able to find all of the case studies and success stories from Taboola campaigns from various different types of clients and geos. You can also check out some of our previous webinars on best practices around landing pages as well, if you'd like some more detail there. Love it. Cool. So the next question is best strategies for campaign optimization. James, you covered a lot of these, but do you want to touch on anything else? Yeah, for sure. I love this stuff. So I could talk about this honestly forever. Like I hope I'm not saying too much, but um, again, I think campaign optimization is the, the key to scaling. So I think it's a pretty um, valuable thing to kind of talk about. Um, I think anytime you talk about optimizing, and this is anything in life or traffic or whatever, it's all about what is the minimum amount of data to be able to make a decision? Like what is the statistically significant amount of data to make a decision, right? Um, and for me, that's optimization. So it's like step one, I'm trying to decide what is the most cost-effective way to see if something works or does not work. Um, when you're trying to uh, make good decisions on publishers, for example, right? Like there's tons of publishers on Taboola, to spend the full amount per conversion per publisher and get a real test can be very cost ineffective. Um, we use early indicators a lot. And I think that is like really the secret to be able to optimize without losing the bank is to, we utilize our landing pages as the indicator of the success before it even gets to the offer. Right. So once we start running traffic, the, the landing page turns into our benchmark. So let's say we have an LPCTR of 20%. When I see stuff that's sub 10%, I'm like, okay, this is just not gonna work. There's no point in continuing to spend there. So it allows me to cut publishers without having to spend the full amount on um, you know, offer conversions. Um, also, I think like doing things correctly in the right order is a big deal. Like by testing creatives first and focusing on, and this is a, totally our internal theory thing like people do it differently i'm just talking about what we like to do but by going images first and getting a high ctr image it makes the cost to test everything else cheaper because i don't need to spend as much um because i've got a higher ctr it means i have a lower cpc so if i need 100 clicks to test something well if i'm paying less per click it reduces the ultimate cost to test all the other variables uh, in my funnel, right? So starting with images, I think is like a great place to go. And then I really work hard on the landing pages. I think that's where I can unlock like really big wins where if I can take a landing page from 10% to 20%, I'm doubling the amount of clicks that get to the offer. I think that's gonna have one of the highest, uh, you know, highest effects. I think um, not necessarily always blocking publishers as much as learning to lower bids. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you can really squeeze out some very cheap cost per lead or cost per sales if you just low bid stuff as yeah. opposed to pause it. And also you may have publishers that are, are not good enough for your current existing funnel, but as you optimize your funnel, there, there are publishers that weren't profitable in the beginning, but now that you fixed up the rest of your stuff, they can become profitable. So I think that's solid. And yeah. finally, uh, split testing mobile and desktop separately and optimizing them as their own unique things. Like they're completely unrelated, different landing pages, different bids. You can find two really strong uh, separate kind of channels for profitability when you split them. Absolutely. All great, really, really great optimization tips. We only have a few minutes left, so we will take it to the final question, which is, does it work? And after hearing all of the comments today, the short answer I would say is yes. Um, the Taboola's whole mission is to help people discover what's interesting in you across the open web. And we really believe in the power of the open web as a massive opportunity itself. 
What Taboola do have is undeniable scale. So we reach 1.4 mil- billion people monthly, 500 million daily active users, and we power 1 trillion recommendations per month. So we are sitting on tons of data. And what Taboola does is really invest into the technological side of our business. We have over 600 employees in R&D alone. Wow. So that Amazing. comes to an end for our webinar we did want to take a few questions but i don't think we will have time unfortunately um is there anything that you'd like to add james or joe about taboola in in general and, and does it work yeah taboola works i've made a lot of money on taboola for a lot of years full stop no questions asked you know there's definitely i've had millions in profit on taboola myself over the last i guess since 2007 years so it absolutely works. It continues to work. I started running in 2016. I'm still running in 2023. So for me personally, there's no way it doesn't work. It, it definitely works. I mean, we built a whole business off of helping clients that can't make native work internally, make it work for them. And we prove it over and over and over again. So if you come in with the right you know, mindset and you do the campaigns properly, you know, Taboola can work and work in a massive way, um, massively scalable. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone who's joined the webinar today. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about Taboola, please don't hesitate to contact our amazing support team or check out some of the resources that we have on our website and our social media. Before you drop off as well, please answer the poll that should come to your screens in the next 60 seconds and enjoy the rest of your week. We will also have a recording coming out of this webinar just in case you joined a little bit later. Thanks for having us on. Susie was great. Very welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye bye.